It's been just a little over one year since Disney, the most powerful entertainment company in the world, got caught saying the quiet part out loud. Namely, that they were using their brand, a brand parents had been trusting with their children for generations, to indoctrinate those children into the LGBTQIA cult. So first of all, I'm tired of pretending like any of us know what pansexual actually means. This is a real bill that empowers parents, it protects our kids, and for a company like Disney, uh, to say that they, this bill should have never passed. First of all, Tucker, they weren't saying anything when this was going through the House. They only started doing this because the mob, the woke mob came after them. But a ton of higher ups, they did this internal meeting about the don't say gay bill and how they intend to continue to, to infect people with this woke bullshit. They don't run this state. Uh, they will never run this state as long as I'm governor. Somebody says, remember when Disney was about entertaining your kids, not indoctrinating them? Good times. You gotta wonder, like, why is the hill to die on to have transgenderism injected into kindergarten classrooms or woke gender ideology injected into second grade classroom. We've launched at Daily Wire and thanks to your leadership, we've launched the biggest initiative in the history of Daily Wire and that is children's programming over at Benke Spur. So as you mentioned, we have five original shows. They are amazing looking. I mean, the, the quality of the product, oh, it's yeah. the proudest I've ever been of any product that we've ever released. Recognizing the scope of this loss, the Daily Wire announced that we would spend $100 million over three years to begin our own kids entertainment company. We host several of the top news podcasts in the world. We launched a chocolate company overnight. We just took Disney head on by releasing 150 episodes of kids content. Bent Key is also available as a standalone purchase for just $99 a year. $99 for great content that your kids will love to watch. Extra, extra, read all about it. I'm reporter Kit Kittridge here with today's news. Just a little over a month ago, in October 2023, conservative media outlet The Daily Wire, a company run by a boring man aptly named Jeremy Boring, and his business partner, the scandalous love child of Alex P. Keaton and Sheldon Cooper, a boy who grew up to be Ben Shapiro, together announced the creation of a new streaming service called BentKey, which is basically a bargain bin knockoff of the Netflix Kids app. According to the unironic Mr. Boring, The Daily Wire chose to launch this new streaming service on the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney company as an intentional FU to the quote, woke leftists who are now running Disney and tarnishing its former image. What kinds of classic, traditional values filled kids shows will they give us? There's only one way to find out. Let's head over to Savvy's office for more information. On October 16th, 2023, The Daily Wire launched Bent Key its new streaming platform for kids entertainment. This platform includes five original shows funded and produced by The Daily Wire. Chip Chilla, Gus Plus Us, A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay, Kid Explorer, and Kid Fit Go. Okay, I'm cultivating mass. In addition, it advertises other shows and movies that will be coming soon in 2024, including a live action Snow White remake, which is intentionally being produced solely for the purpose of competing with Disney's upcoming Snow White remake. I spent the past few weeks diving into this streaming service, watching as many episodes of these shows as I could, and researching as much as I could about the development of this platform and the production of these shows. So today, we are doing a Daily Wire deep dive. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. Hey, what's up my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books. On this channel, we talk about books and business, and we often look at things with more of a literary analysis type of perspective. If those type of videos interest you, then please don't forget to subscribe because I put out new videos like this one every Friday. I'd like to give a thank you to my Patreon supporters as well. Patreon supporters' names are listed on the screen, and if you go and take a look in the description below, you can find my Patreon supporters who contribute $5 a month and up who have the option to link their own stuff in my description below as the reward for that. So thank you so much to everyone who supports this channel. If you guys are interested in behind the scenes blog posts and photos and additional content like that, then you might want to check out my Patreon as well. It helps support the channel. Thanks so much. Though this new app launched over a month ago, it 
it's been recently making headlines because of the cringy, one-sided feud that they're attempting to start with Disney. Mainly, the fact that Bent Key, in addition to featuring a variety of TV and web shows, is also in the process of producing its first live-action feature film. And that feature film isn't a project made out of passion or a really cool movie idea or a genuine love for the art of filmmaking. This first feature film is made solely as a fuck you to Disney, which guys, I don't like Disney either, but is pettiness really their only motivation here? As the Daily Beast explains, if teachers in certain states today were to mention during class that Mississippi once banned Sesame Street in the state for being too racially integrated, those teachers might get fired. All it takes is one parent objecting to kids learning about inclusion, and it's a wrap. Even if the kids were just learning about the forces historically preventing kids from learning about inclusion. It is into this chaotic educational environment that reactionary platform The Daily Wire just launched its new kids show streaming app, Bent Key, a corrective to the scourge of two woke children's programs like Sesame Street that continue ramming inclusion down kids' throats. More specifically, though, it's meant to be anti-Disney. So what exactly happened with Disney and Snow White? Back in 2016, Disney began planning a live-action remake of their 1937 classic animated film Snow White. Why? Because Disney makes live-action remakes of everything nowadays. I, I personally don't like it. I think it's awful. It's a cash grab, in my opinion. I think a lot of these movies did so well as animated films because they utilize the medium of animation. Like, look at the original line. Lion King versus the 2019 live action version. And by live action, I mean CGI because there's only one true live action Lion King and it's Noel Marshall's 1981 snuff film Roar that's known for inspiring Tippi Hedren to divorce him. Anyway, we all saw how animated lions were able to make facial expressions that don't work on photorealistic lions. We saw how the color palette of an animated landscape could tell a visual story a lot more clearly than one inspired by nature documentaries. They made the live action Beauty and the Beast where Belle's dress was mid. You can't have Belle's beautiful yellow dress just being mid. I'm sorry, it's a crime against fashion. You're tacky and I hate you. And then we had the live action Little Mermaid where despite Halle Bailey having an absolutely gorgeous voice that carried the film, nothing could save it from photorealistic flounder. That That's what nightmares are made of. Or from Under the Sea losing all of its creative animated effects that made the 1989 film so memorable. Basically, what I'm saying is animation is good actually. I keep hearing people saying that Disney's really missing out on the opportunity to remake all their movies with Muppets instead of pure live action. Like, Disney owns the rights to the Muppets. Why are they not remaking all of their classic films with Muppet casts? Imagine Beauty and the Beast, where everyone is a Muppet except the Beast, who just looks like a normal guy, but he's terrifying to the rest of the cast because they're all Muppets. <laughs> I'd love that. Anyway, this is all to say that I'm also not excited for Disney's upcoming live action remake of Snow White, which is set to release in 2025. So I'm not gonna see it. I'm not going to pay for a movie that doesn't look that good to me. But what I'm also not gonna do is hire an entire production crew to make my own even shittier live action remake of Snow White. But you know who is doing that? The Daily Wire. And their criticism of Disney's Snow White isn't really the same as what mine is. While I think Disney is being lazy with these live action films and squandering their true potential, The Daily Wire is actively angry at this movie. And the reason that they're so angry is that the lead actress cast by Disney, Rachel Ziegler, is just bringing a new take to the character. Everything you see today from Disney was made possible by Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. So there's no better example of Disney's disregard for their own heritage or their disregard for their own audience than their current remake of their own classic film. Their lead actress, the new Snow White, Rachel Ziegler, has summed it up, saying, quote, I just mean, it's no longer 1937. We absolutely wrote a Snow White that she's not going to be saved by the prince and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. While Disney still uses Walt's name, they've all but abandoned his legacy. Instead of telling stories about timeless truth, Disney's new Snow White is an apology for their past and will expose children to the popular but destructive lies of the current moment. In addition to announcing the launch of our kids' entertainment company, I also want to announce today that company's first live-action feature film. You heard it here, folks. The very concept of women having leadership abilities is exposing kids to the destructive lies of the moment. 
whatever that means. So what did Rachel Ziegler even say that was so offensive to Jeremy Boring's boring sensibilities? Rachel Ziegler has been described as a walking PR disaster for Disney. And we absolutely wrote a Snow White. That she's is not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can. There's a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. Yeah. <laughs> weird, weird. That's it. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to see the movie either, but really that's it. She just wants to play the character differently than in the animated version? Isn't that preferable to just doing like a shot-by-shot -shot remake? Don't you want the movie to be different from the one that already exists? And yeah, I'll be real, she's kind of right here. Like, Snow White is a really fun movie to rewatch when you're stoned off your ass and you want to marvel at the animation and the colors and how absolutely fucking weird it is. But if we're being honest, that prince was a stalker. She's not wrong. And I don't find the original movie offensive because I'm capable of understanding the context of the era that the movie was made in and the era that it's set in, but what's so offensive about making a different version, about wanting to do it differently? I don't get it. Then Key announced their own version of Snow White, which stars none other than Brett Cooper, a woman who both looks and talks shockingly similar to Ben Shapiro and is also employed by Ben Shapiro, but somehow claims to not be related to him. Like you're telling me th this woman, is not Ben Shapiro's sister, or daughter, or niece, or clone? I am your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. Brett Cooper will be playing Snow White in this version, which includes a really boring trailer that tells us nothing about the plot and instead lingers way too long on nature shots with no interesting visual color palette to tell the story in any way, and again, looks like it would have been better animated. So that's going to be their first live action movie. But what about all the content that's already currently available on Bentkey? What about the shows? What about the app itself? We're going to review most of the big shows in depth in just a moment. But first, let's talk a little bit about the Bentkey key website and app itself, how it actually works as a streaming service. Now throughout today's video, I'm going to be collaborating with another content creator, Jordan Black, who runs the channel Dead Domain. I will link their channel in the description below. Jordan has some fantastic video essays about Matt Walsh and why he is the way he is, as well as a huge documentary about their process of infiltrating a hate church as a trans person. So definitely check out the channel Dead Domain if you haven't already watched it before. I will link that channel in the description below. So throughout this video, I'm going to be including discussions with Jordan about our experiences of trying to watch Bent Key shows, trying to navigate this app, and just our overall reviews of that. And then also stay tuned for a video on Jordan's channel as well about this topic where we're going to be continuing our discussion. That video is going to come out in a few days. For now, let's talk about the process of actually using this app, the UI, the user experience of it, the way it's set up. What was that like? What was it like to use it on phone? What was it like to use it on desktop? Did the app app work. You were mentioning that like the app itself was giving you trouble when we were like when you were first going in to watch the shows. Yeah, it from the very beginning and the, it's actually weird because I tried to get it working when I I first paid for the subscription, logged in with the account, tried to get it working on phone and on uh, a tablet, which is how I usually watch a lot of streaming stuff. And the tablet actually, and this is true, I have a screenshot of it at the very top where it shows like the, the featured shows and it has a little blurb about the show. Uh, the blurb was Lorem Ipsum. <laughs> and that is that is true. And I have I have screenshots of that. Um, that. That's hilarious. And it it wouldn't let me, even though in this, you know, I, I've talked about it before, but I spent more than a week trying to get my dog. My dog knows my frustration at this. <laughs> The problem was on the app is that every time I used it, after the, the whole kerfuffle where I actually had to contact Daily Wire support and get sent through just a legion of bots every time, um, only to get like suggested things that didn't actually help me and then try to talk to a support person. And then one time a support person just didn't get back to me for several days. So I had to redo the whole process. And then when I finally got logged back in, the... I could only actually access the content if I freshly logged in. And this is still true as far as like yesterday, several weeks after the, the app is launched on both the phone and the tablet version. I can only watch the content I've paid for after logging in each time. And another fun little thing about the login is that every time you go to like manage the account options, whether it's logging in, whether it's 
you know, I'm, I'm imagining you can change like some restrictions around the content. Uh, the only thing it has you do is enter the year you were born. And it doesn't check that against anything. Like you, you, when you sign up for the account, you don't enter that in. So I've, I've tried it several times and you can literally enter as long as it's like 1930 onward, you can pretty much enter any four digits and it'll accept it. That's really weird. There is a bizarre, like lack of oversight. There's, um, as I've, I will probably use in the full video, I have recorded like almost full episodes off the thing because it doesn't have the same like recording protections that a lot of other streaming apps do. Like you can, you can just literally record right off of your phone or your tablet if you want. Yeah. I noticed that the website has a terrible user experience just in, in my like couple days of being logged in. So I didn't have the login issues because I'm logged into the same account as you are. And I have been watching exclusively on desktop. I haven't even tried downloading the app or anything like that. But on desktop, what I've noticed is, you know how like on Netflix or any of the other streaming sites, when an episode is reaching its end, you hit the button to play the next episode. I can't get it to do that. There's like no next episode button. So like every time I get to the end of an episode, I have to go back to the homepage for that show and select an episode again. Oh, really? <laughs> That's what's been happening. Yeah, I haven't seen any next episode options. And maybe maybe it's just my computer. Maybe it's my browser. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just missing something but the episodes are not auto playing when it's done the show will be over and then i just have to like go select a new episode and it's really odd how this it is does, set up <laughs> it does auto play like next episode in the app if you let it run all the way through the credits okay. but it does not have any kind of skip intro option yeah which i feel is almost because so many of the shows are so short, like especially the ones that are like their bent key originals. Yeah. Like most episodes are under 10 minutes. Yeah. And usually a minute of that is their intro. Like there, there's just a lot of padding in general, especially I feel in things like Chip Chilla. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And, and like a skip intro option would be wonderful for the that Chip Chilla show intro goes on forever it's too. It's so the longest long. theme song. Yeah. Oh my God. And they play it like they play it multiple times per episode too, because not only does it open the show, but it also closes the show. So the app itself kind of sucks. The UI isn't great and there are a decent number of issues with it. But what about the shows themselves? Are the show's Dennis Prager levels of conservative propaganda, or are they more like Tim Allen's conservatism? That is to say, not really relevant to the quality of his work. Capitalism is the only way to lift great numbers of people out of poverty. The answer is a mix of both. There are a few shows on this platform that are surprisingly awesome, but there were also some shows that were boring, pointless, plagiarized from other shows, or hinting at getting to a propaganda zone. But let's start with the positive. I'm going to talk about a few shows on this platform that I loved, and then after that, we'll move into three shows that I really, really did not love. But first, three shows I loved. Our first excellent show is a Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. It's like it's one part Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and one part Mary Poppins. It has that sort of gentleness and quietness of a, of a Mr. Rogers, and it has that whimsy and magic of a Mary Poppins. It's, it's warm and golden. It isn't gray. It isn't bright. It's not like kids content, right? But it's also not like drab modern content. It's this it's nostalgic, but it's today. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't be more proud of the show. A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay is an adorable Mr. Rogers style show that encourages kids to slow down and notice the wonder and joy in the world all around us. That's genuine. I really think the show did a great job with that. Plus, Mabel McClay kind of has the same aesthetic as I do in a lot of my videos, so I think I'm required to love her. By the way, Daily Wire fans, you're going to appreciate this real quick because you're capitalists. I have a Boss Bay moment coming up real quick. This unicorn dress, this unicorn dress right here is my original art, and it is available on my fashion and merch website, hipsterunicornfashion.myshopify.com. And this plush version of my dog, Chewy, is available on my website, foreverhomefriends.com, where 10% of profits benefit Chicago animal shelters. Now, 
Back to Mabel McClay. Mabel McClay is a Daily Wire original show not having aired anywhere outside of the Bent Key app. However, it's slightly different than some of their other original properties, ones that we'll discuss later because this one was made by a couple, Katie and Ryan Chase, two former theater nerds who previously ran an improv school for kids. They seem very passionate about providing quality entertainment and the Mr. Roger style inspiration in the show really does come through. Each episode takes us through Mabel's house where she lives with Jasper, an adorable puppet dog. And because of that, I have my little dog friend right here too. Each episode has a theme like courage or creativity with the various plots of the episode revolving around that theme. Unlike the other original shows, including Chip Chilla, whose episodes are usually less than 10 minutes each, and Kid Explorer with some of their episodes barely cracking three minutes, Mabel McClay is a full length TV show right on par with a show that would air in a 30 minute time slot. In each episode, Mabel answers a question that she gets through the mail, which sets off the theme of the day. For example, in the episode about courage, Mabel has to give advice to a girl who writes in, scared to sing a song in front of the whole school. This segment of the show is called the question of the day. Just look at that set. The complex contraptions, the little animated puppet animals, everything that goes into Mabel actually getting to the question in the first place. Everything about it is colorful, it's creative, it was planned and thought about well in advance. When Mabel gets her question of the day, she then heads through the TV into an imaginary town, which is filled with hand-drawn and stop-motion animated sequences. And the animation in this part is just honestly awesome. So then Mabel helps Jane the sheep gain the courage to give a speech in front of the town, which she then successfully does, before Mabel heads back to her home. At home, Mabel meets one of her friends in the backyard, a Broadway star named Laura Osnes. So in addition to being a Broadway performer, Laura Osnes is known for two other things. First, being one of the voices on the Daily Wire's flagship show Chip Chilla, which we're gonna talk about a little later, and second, for not being super down with the vaccines. One of her biggest controversies happened in mid-2021, you know, the time when the vaccines were coming out and we were all taking them, and Laura Osnes ended up leaving a Broadway cast because she preferred to remain unvaccinated. As The Independent reports, Laura Osnes, 35, apparently left the cast of the forthcoming Crazy For You show at the Guild Hall in East Hampton, New York. She departed the cast because she refused to be vaccinated, the publication says. According to the theater's director, Josh Gladstone, the rules are in line with those provided by the Actors' Equity for live performances by actors and musicians. Just a few months ago, Osnes told Nashville's WSMV News, in 2021, I faced some cancel culture with a tabloid news article in the paper. The community disowned me and deserted me, and we definitely felt a need for a change. We felt we had to get out. It wasn't even safe for me to remain in New York anymore. So it wasn't safe for her to remain in New York. Okay, Laura, it's not safe for you because people there dislike you and are going to give you criticism. It's not safe for the entire cast and crews that you're performing with because you refuse to vaccinate yourself from a dangerous virus. What are the rules? I don't think you're the same. Anyway, that's been Laura Osnes's biggest claim to fame as of late. And we know that the Daily Wire is all about taking canceled celebrities and helping them rehabilitate their image. Now, to be clear, nothing Laura says or does in this episode of Mabel McClay is in any way related to COVID or to her controversies. That's not a critique of the show itself. It's just an interesting side note on how she's now acting in multiple Daily Wire shows because that's a pattern for the Daily Wire, scooping up the canceled celebrities and giving them work, which again, they, they can do that. That's the free market, baby. After Laura leaves Mabel's house, Mabel goes back inside with her dog, Jasper, who wants to show off his new knight costume that he just made himself so that he could be brave and overcome his fear of the vacuum cleaner. I honestly thought this was super cute, just the cutest thing ever. The Jasper puppet is so adorable, and the whole plot about him overcoming the fear of the vacuum was legitimately funny. At the end of every episode, Mabel puts everything she's gathered from the day's adventures into the masterpiece machine, and the machine works its magic to create a book. That book includes a cartoon version of Mabel summarizing the day's events through a song that shows up in the book's text. Now, I absolutely love the Masterpiece Machine. I love the book it creates. I love the ending song that wraps up each episode. Honestly, the structure of this show is just so well executed. The life lessons it presents are broken down in ways that kids can fully understand with fun, colorful, well-animated, constructed sets to keep kids' attention. This is one of the few shows on this 
app that I could legitimately see kids loving. And it makes sense. It's not like Ben Shapiro directed the show. The show was made by people with experience in children's entertainment with a genuine passion for their work. The Christian Post conducted an interview with Katie and Ryan Chase, the couple behind the show, and it says a lot about the show's inspirations and the reasons why the show works so well. I think also we, we felt really inspired um, to to find a solution to this problem we've had as parents where we'll turn off a show in the limited um, amount of time our kids have seen sort of modern kids content and they truly have um, flushed cheeks, dilated eyes, they're uh, crazy behavior, they don't want to turn it off, they're, they've obviously been so hyper stimulated by the content um, and so when we show them older things of the the way shows kind of used to feel and uh, they don't have that reaction and so we thought well, let's make a modern take on that stuff it's it's so good and and so that's what we set out to do so i absolutely agreed with this point the pacing of this show is perfect i do think we live in a very fast-paced world with social media being so accessible everywhere with technology being so advanced that we can call text or email people at any hour of the day where short form apps like tiktok and instagram prioritize short attention spans and while those developments can be great for a lot of things it's also important to have media that slows down and encourages us to live in the moment and be mindful of our surroundings and they love they also love the town of banterbury it's this little stop motion world we created and it's these little paper and wood pieces and it's so practical and so sweet and is is really become a, a favorite favorite of theirs it, it celebrates the idea that wondering about things is a beautiful thing and um really it's about a love of learning because young children have this at a really young age really easily you don't have to teach them to love to learn about things and wonder about things and ask questions anybody who works with children or has children knows that and so um, i think we wanted to preserve that and embrace it it's primarily geared toward preschool or younger elementary but our hope is that in the same way old school houses could kind of work for all kiddos at the same time that that maybe large families with multiple siblings could all enjoy it together and the main way to accomplish that was to make sure mabel is a character who speaks in a non-babyish, non-obnoxious way. And so her tone is gentle, she's very calm, she has a big vocabulary, and she doesn't stop to explain big words. Um, so we kind of had this spirit of like, little kids, keep up, we trust that you will, and big kids, we have stuff for you too. Um, and, and sort of had that approach with all pieces of this show. So yeah, I could absolutely see the pure heart and soul that went into the stop motion segments and the overall artistry of the set design and the props, especially the puppets. And I have to also agree with this point, the one about how we don't need to tone down everything for a younger audience. Kids can learn from context when the material is engaging and relatable. Now there is one other point that I'd like to discuss about this. Guys, is it just me or is Mabel Blue Clay like kind of queer coded? I mean, like, I mean that in the, like, Miss Frizzle kind of way. I don't mean that she's canonically a lesbian within the show. I mean that this woman is going to cause a, a lot of lesbian awakenings. I know she would have for me if I watched the show 25 years ago. So I think we were both talking about how there's the show A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. I love this show. Honestly, I've been watching it. It's cute as hell. And... I don't know if Ben Shapiro is just an ally now or something, but Mabel's got the biggest lesbian energy. This would be like my lesbian aunt icon growing up if I had this show to watch. I love this show, but it is yeah, it was really... not conceptualized by them. Yeah, no, not at all. And <laughs> and you can kind of tell because of how and and I I I think I forwarded you to an interview with them and the the people behind it like they have a a history of working in kids entertainment. They have a history of working in like. LA and just the entertainment industry in general. And it seems like they've been trying to get the show either picked up by somewhere. And you can you can tell even in that interview, they say like, oh, you know, Mr. Rogers was a big inspiration. And you can like, it It really is kind of a, a show in the template of Mr. Rogers. You have like these kind of imaginary world segments. You have him talking to puppets or, or Mabel talking to puppets. You have, uh, they'll bring on a guest to kind of teach kids about something fun. But that show is, I think, easily the best of the bunch not only because it's the most substantial but like again like like you were saying there is a like there is a decided increase in production value yes uh, especially in like the there, there are these really cool like almost paper mario animated sequences the that animation was like, in the show is fantastic like when i the... watched it i was like oh my gosh this is so freaking cool 
the live action and the animation segments they've got sometimes like these little stop motion things where you've got the characters on like little board game pieces and then you've also got like the live action segments which are lit really well the color palette makes sense like the vi there was thought put into the visuals and the set behind it everything about the production of it is good and so when I watched the show I was like I'm surprised they have something this good on here, but but they do. And honestly, like, I wish they didn't own the rights because like, if I had kids, I'd, I'd love for them to watch this show, but I don't, I'm not going to pay Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Boring money to get to watch it. I actually did notice because every show I'm, I'm watching through, I'm like, all right, is there any weird like dog whistles or weird propaganda stuff in there? For the most part, I thought no. The only thing I noticed in the Mabel McClay show was I think in like one of the last episodes, there's an actress or a Broadway star that she has as a special guest. I, I didn't know anything about this woman. I looked her up and she was big in being an anti-vaxxer, I think. Like she had like a lot of stuff about not uh, wanting to take vaccines and like speaking out and being like the woke mob is canceling me for not taking my vaccine and things like that. It wasn't relevant to the show at all. So like when Jeremy Boring and them have like done these advertisements for this streaming service saying like, we're taking all the politics out of things. There's nothing political in here. Like for the most part, that seems pretty honest. There really isn't, uh, at least in that show. We can talk about some of the other shows now, but some of these shows I'm like, okay, th this is decent. I, I think I think kids could learn something from this genuinely. So I'm not going to like give a fake negative review. I'll be honest. I That show was really good. Well, and I, I totally agree. And I think the reason that it, they it's so easy for them to make such apolitical content in this case is because like so many of the shows are aimed at like toddlers like yeah like babies uh, i feel like once you get to like the age of six or seven you are firmly aged out of like the target demographic of all of their original content and i think that makes it a little bit easier on the production side to to keep things you know mm -hmm. pretty apolitical teaching these very broad life lessons but i think it also speaks to the fact that like they're i, I don't know how much appeal their content has to preteens to the the kind of slightly older Saturday morning cartoon demographic that I think they're also trying to go after. Now, that same Christian Post interview that I mentioned earlier wasn't all positive in my opinion. Some of it did unfortunately raise a few flags in terms of the creators and their intentions behind the show. We owned and operated an improv school for kiddos in Los Angeles for uh, 10 years and um, and then we had three kiddos of our own. And so in a lot of ways, we feel so perfectly prepared. Oh, and before all of that, we were actors and sort of dabbling in that and went to school for that as real young people. Um, so yeah, in some ways, it's all of those things coming together in this moment, which has felt really lovely and exciting. Um, and uh, we have a friend, Jeremy Boring, who was starting the Bent Key and starting kids content. And we met him in LA. He's a such a creative and kind person. And um, he said, do you guys want to work together? You guys know more about kids than anybody I know. And we said, sure. How about um, something inspired by Mr. Rogers? Because that is our favorite show. And so uh, that's what we kind of set out to do. So this was a passion project and Jeremy Boring provided the funding to bring it to life. That's clear from the quality that Ben and Jeremy were not the creative team behind this. However, I do think it's a little unfortunate that this couple, who's clearly extremely talented, extremely capable of producing wonderful entertainment, that they consider Jeremy Boring to be a kind and creative person. The, the judgment just isn't making sense there to me. We homeschool our kids. We're specific about all the content that they take in and and who's teaching them and and who is that person and what do they believe and um and so those we are those people yeah so this was the part that i thought was weird not that they homeschool their kids that's their right homeschooling can happen for a variety of reasons it's the way that they framed the discussion it's not that they homeschool their kids because they notice that their kids thrive better in a different kind of learning environment or because they feel better equipped to provide a quality education in the area's public schools no, they homeschool their kids because they care about who is teaching their kids and what they believe. Now, I'll be real, I'm not that great at dog whistles, but I'm pretty sure this is alluding to the whole teacher danger, satanic panic revival that all the guys at the Daily Wire and their hashtag ally Ron DeSantis are trying to drum up. You can't trust public schools. They might teach your kids leftist things. The fact that they even care about the beliefs of their children's teachers, that was a little iffy to me.
It's interesting because we didn't make, Mabel is not a faith-based show. Um, we wanted it to be open and accessible for every family to gather and celebrate the values and timeless virtues that we all agree on. And, um, and also our faith is a huge part of who we are. And so our hope and our prayer is really that our light can really kind of shine in that way. And we think that it will. And there are some episodes that we see, we'll, we'll, we think will tee up Christian families to continue the conversation um, just perfectly in, in a way that, that feels good and that also um, keeps the show open for all kinds of families. We were really inspired by Mr. Rogers, honestly, in this way. He was an ordained minister. He had very strong convictions and and he made, made a show that was accessible to all families and um, had a huge impact in that way. Now, I'm going to agree here. A show that has broad stretching theoretical concepts of Christian values that aren't explicitly or exclusively Christian, that can be well done. Much like how Mr. Rogers had his faith being a huge part of his life, but never to the exclusion of other sets of beliefs and never to the alienation of his audience. This is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I think this is all well and good, but I also think it's a little hypocritical. Let me explain. Making a show that's based on Mr. Rogers, but also claiming your entire platform is 100% apolitical and also streaming it on an explicitly right-wing run network. I mean, that's all a little confusing. I agree that Mabel McClay evokes a similar feeling to Mr. Rogers, and I think the production team behind the show did a fantastic job recreating that atmosphere. But in what universe was Mr. Rogers ever apolitical, let alone reactionary or in line with what the conservatives of today would believe? In previous videos, I've talked about this concept called restorative nostalgia, a term coined by Russian professor Svetlana Boim, which explains our tendency as humans to picture the past not as what it truly was, but filtered through the lens of how we thought it should be. It's very easy for us to rewrite history, even if unintentionally, to glorify the good old days, because at its core, nostalgia is a natural feeling for mortal beings like us to latch onto. The past will always be farther away from our eventual deaths than the present. And that's just a very oversimplified way of explaining the tendency adults have to restore the past, to view it through a filter that isn't necessarily rose-colored, but is rather whatever color you personally like best best. From right-wing influencers, we see this through a false characterization of how much better all our media was before the woke leftists took over. It's where we get concepts like the one that I covered in a video I posted last December about Sidney Watson's The Death of the Tomboy, in which a millennial conservative influencer asserts that back in the 80s and 90s, it used to be cool to subvert gender norms as long as you didn't get all gay about it, but that nowadays the LGBTQ community is here to force people into boxes or else declare that you're one of us. But what Sidney ignores is that in the 19 1980s and 1990s, it was only cool to subvert gender norms within alternative and counterculture communities. Mainstream Western culture still found it scandalous for boys to wear dresses much like they do today, and considered female phases of ignoring traditional beauty standards to be something that they'd grow out of or else they'd bully you out of it. That is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. My point with all of this is we now have yet another example of restorative nostalgia taking hold in conservative-run media. In this case, The Daily Wire and Bent Key are claiming that past kids' content shows like Mr. Rogers are better than what we have today. Yeah, why are you singing the money song? Not just because of their quality, but because today we have Disney offering woke political content with discussions of racism and LGBTQ topics, and all of that is inserting politics into our entertainment. Back in our day, we had good, completely controversy-free content like Mr. Rogers, but we didn't. Because if we were to actually travel a few decades back in time, we'd see that Mr. Rogers was considered wildly political, wildly controversial. He wasn't well liked, just like Disney's more diverse content is today. In fact, in addition to being a devout Christian, a loving husband, an ordained minister, and a fantastic role model for the children of Generation X, Mr. Rogers was also an anti-capitalist, a supporter of racial equality in the civil rights movement, and an ally to the LGBTQ community. And he showed these qualities directly on his show 
for kids because it's not woke or leftist or anti-Christian to help kids understand conflict. In 2019, the Washington Post published an article titled, Mr. Rogers wasn't just nice, he wanted to take down consumerism, which details the ways that even in his time, even among his colleagues, Mr. Rogers was considered weird and unpopular, not the god-tier role model that we remember him as today. As the article explains, we all know Fred Rogers was a saint. He is solidified in our collective cultural imagination, frozen in a cardigan and sneakers, his supernatural attunement to the emotional traumas of childhood, slow-talking puppets, and the subjects both whimsical and deep. We celebrate the Presbyterian minister for his kindness, when instead, during his time, he was known as a rather intense man, with rigid standards and a bit of a social oddball. Fred was very controversial for most of his career, said Basil Cox, the executive director of Rogers' nonprofit, according to the biography The Good Neighbor by Maxwell King. King's biography includes a story that epitomizes Rogers' inner motivation. Smack in the middle of when his show became a modest success on PBS in the early 1970s, Hallmark asked Rogers to collaborate in decorating its flagship store in Midtown Manhattan for Christmas time. Rogers and his friend and colleague Elliot Daly traveled from Pittsburgh to New York to check out the scene. Other celebrities and influencers had created garishly festive and over-the-top displays, but Rogers went a different route. He went back to his home in Pittsburgh and concocted a design plan. His window display would be this, a Norfolk Island pine tree, the height of a three or four foot tall child. No ornaments or decorations, just a simple green tree planted in clear glass so that onlookers could see the roots of the tree. And in front of it, there was to be a plaque that simply said, I like you just the way you are. Fred Rogers was a complete weirdo, unable to fit in, unable to assimilate and smooth his rough edges the way the majority of us can. In the beginning, his friends and colleagues agree that he had more detractors than admirers. Ultimately, Rogers was asked by a large company, one that sold greeting cards and wrapping paper and is now quite famous for prestige ornaments and schlocky holiday films, to decorate its store window. And he chose a bare tree with not a whiff of decorations, not a single tie into his own show or any other toy or trinket aimed at children. That tiny tree is a symbol of the disappointment Fred Rogers felt as he watched television programming become part of the American experience in ways that fell short of his expectations. Until television became such a tool for selling, it was a fabulous medium for education. That's what I had always hoped it would be. And sure, that's just one story about Mr. Rogers not wanting to make everything so corporate. But what about his direct on-screen activism? Many of us know the story of one of Mr. Rogers' most iconic episodes, an episode from 1969 where Mr. Rogers and his friend, Officer Clemens, visit the backyard pool together. Thank you for your refreshments. Oh, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> You're welcome, Officer Clemens. This scene aired amid civil unrest over pool segregation policies in the U.S., and many perceive it as Rogers taking a stand against racism. The same year it aired, the Supreme Court ruled that pools could not be segregated by race. Clemens discussed these striking clips in the 2018 documentary about the show Won't You Be My Neighbor while promoting his memoir published in May this year. They didn't want black people to come and swim in their swimming pools, and Fred said, that's absolutely ridiculous, Clemens recalled in the documentary. Explaining how Rogers offered him a seat and a towel, Clemens told WBUR, my god, those were powerful words. It was transformative to sit there with him thinking to myself oh something wonderful is happening here this is not what it looks like it's much bigger he continued many people as i've traveled around the country share with me what that particular moment meant to them because he was telling them you cannot be racist and one guy i'll never forget said to me when that program came on we were actually discussing the fact that black people were inferior and mr rogers cut right through it he said essentially that scene ended the argument Today, seeing people of two different races share a pool on TV wouldn't give most of us a second thought. But back in 1969, what Mr. Rogers did was considered political. And on top of that, Mr. Rogers, as a Presbyterian minister, a lifelong Christian who wove Bible verses into his content, that same Mr. Rogers was also cool with the LGBTQ community. Remember Officer Clemens we just talked about? His actor, Francois Clemens, was also gay. Mr. Rogers had a TV show where one of his best friends was a gay black man in the 1960s. Now, if you want to make the argument that Mr. Rogers was publicly apolitical in the LGBTQ aspect of his career, you could. In his memoir, Clemens spoke about the ways that Rogers didn't want Clemens' LGBTQ identity to be part of the show at all, going so far as to even encourage him to stay in the closet and not come out. So it's fair to criticize Mr. Rogers for that. But we also need to keep in mind that this was 1969, just two years after multiple U.S. states refused to air Star Trek for daring to show an interracial kiss on television. Honestly, at the time, Clemens being an out gay person could have threatened the entire production on a children's show. Isn't it nice that TV isn't that stringent anymore? 
No, Ben Shapiro doesn't think so. And not only that, but on top of it, Mr. Rogers may have even been part of the LGBTQ community himself. Obviously, I could never make a definitive statement on that because Mr. Rogers is no longer alive, can't clarify what he meant for us, but there was significant evidence showing that this might have been true. In 2015, a new book came out called The Good Neighbor, all about the life of Mr. Rogers. That book cites an interview Rogers had with one of his friends, Dr. Williams Hirsch, who was also himself part of the LGBTQ community. I found the direct quote from the book in Out Magazine. During the interview when Rogers was asked how he would label his own sexuality on a scale from 1 to 10, he answered, Well, you know, I must be right smack in the middle because I have found women attractive and I have found men attractive. So Mr. Rogers was a cool dude with multiple gay friends and may have been a bisexual icon himself. A dude who tackled racial segregation on his TV show aimed at children back in the 1960s. I highly doubt that if Ben Shapiro or Jeremy Boring had been working in the industry 50 years ago that they would have actually supported Mr. Rogers. In place of Disney, instead, he would have been the woke leftist that they were trying to compete with, even though Mr. Rogers was a lifelong Christian and a registered Republican. The point I'm getting at here is, what is and is not political in media isn't a clearly defined box that never changes. It evolves based on the widening and shrinking of the Overton window. It evolves based on the ways that we evolve as humans and as a collective. So I commend Katie and Ryan Chase for using Mr. Rogers as a source of inspiration for their new show. The influence definitely shines through in A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay, but it's completely dishonest to pretend that Mr. Rogers wasn't controversial in his own day, too. To pretend that a Mr. Rogers-inspired show is the polar opposite of Disney's inclusions of racial and gender diversity is to wildly misunderstand the impact of Mr. Rogers. But all of that said, I do think Mabel McClay is a great show. If I had kids and this show were available anywhere other than a $100 flat annual rate streaming app with a terrible UI, then yeah, I'd let them watch it. I felt fairly similar about one other Daily Wire original show, and that is Gus Plus Us. I don't have a ton to say about Gus Plus Us other than it's a cute show, it's clearly inspired by the Muppets and Sesame Street, and that the woman hosting it is also extremely attractive. I'm not sure where the Daily Wire is finding so many extremely hot women to host their shows, but good for them, honestly good for them. What I liked about Mabel McClay and Gus Plus Us is the use of practical effects and the artistic craftsmanship behind the shows. In a world where it's much cheaper to create shitty CGI effects, taking the time to construct props and create practical effects sometimes starts to feel like a lost art. The artistry of these shows is just fantastic, and honestly, I hope one day someone else will buy the rights to them. Now, there is one final show that I want to give a positive review on this platform, and this is easily the best show by far of the entire catalog. I was legitimately blown away by how good this show was, and this was a little show called Clangers. Clangers is legitimately a work of art. It has some of the smoothest stop motion animation I've ever seen. The music is not only catchy, but it's also emotional, perfectly matching the tone of each scene to take viewers on an auditory journey as well as a visual one. And the way these little guys are built, my god, just the craftsmanship, the set design, this was built by someone who clearly loves what they do. How did the Daily Wire ever possibly make a show this gorgeous? The answer is that they didn't. Clangers existed long before Bentkey and all the Daily Wire did was buy the rights to an already existing show. As the Wikipedia page for Clangers explains, Clangers is a British stop-motion animated children's television series consisting of short films about a family of mouse-like creatures who live on and inside a small moon-like planet. They speak only in a whistled language and eat green soup supplied by the soup dragon and blue string pudding. The programs were originally broadcast on BBC One between 1969 and 1972, followed by a special episode which was broadcast in 1974. However, the show then made a return in 2015, producing three new seasons that ran from 2015 until 2020. As Wikipedia says, BBC's CBBS channel and the American Preschool channel Sprout produced a new series for broadcasting in their 2015 schedules, with Michael Palin narrating in place of the late Oliver Postgate. The American Preschool channel Sprout were major funders and co-producers, having commissioned the series in tandem with BBC with William Shatner narrating. So this show is its own thing. All that Bent Key did was acquire the rights to a 2015 series produced in the UK and upload them on their own service, which on its own isn't a bad thing. I'm glad that there are kids out there who are unfortunate enough to grow up with Ben Shapiro-ass parents, but that they at least get exposure to this beautiful kind of art. Anyway, 
Justice for Clangers. So those were the three shows that I thought were pretty good. Gus Plus Us was a bit forgettable, but then again, I'm 31 years old and have no children, so I'm not really the target demographic for it anyway. The puppets were cute, and it was simplistic enough that if they released a Polish dove of it, I'd probably watch it for the language practice. But some of the shows they acquired, like Clangers, and like another show I actually didn't get around to watching it, Rune, also look pretty good. They are legitimately decent, if not awesome shows. And of their original works, Mabel McClay is easily the best show on the platform, from its bright and colorful set designs to its fun songs and creative use of mixed media animation. But other than those shows, all the other original properties produced by The Daily Wire, they're pretty shit. Like, they're really, really shit. I wanted to be festive, so I'm wearing my hipster teddy bear shirt. Guess where this shirt is also available? That's right, my merch site, hipsterunicorn.myshopify.com. No fashion in there, that's the Instagram handle. hipsterunicorn.myshopify.com. Linked in the description below. Like all items on that site, this shirt features my original art. Hope you like it. Now, I think we need to talk about the shows that Ben and Jeremy have been pushing the hardest. The show that their website is filled with toys and merch for. The show that's got everyone talking. And that show is called... Drumroll, please! Bup, 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 bup. Bluey! No, it's not called Bluey. It's called Chip Chilla, but it's a borderline plagiarism of Bluey, and everyone has noticed. Then you have Chip Chilla, the first show we ever announced, an animated show about a family of homeschooling chinchillas who, uh, it's these wonderful parents who just invest immediately into the lives of their kids. They sort of meet their kids where they are, and they're always looking for an opportunity to teach them, which makes it sound like it's an educational show. It is not in any way an educational show. One thing you and I talked about from the very beginning is this idea of cultural literacy, that the cartoons that I grew up with, from, from Looney Tunes Merry Melodies, all the way to the kind of Saturday morning shows that were popular when I was a little kid. They all contained uh, sort of the American mythology within them. They, they contained our literary history within them. I first learned about uh, Tom Sawyer convincing his friends to whitewash the fence, not from reading Mark Twain, but from watching Bugs Bunny. That's how all art used to be until really this very modern moment in which we live where it's now, where the American canon, the Western canon is considered somehow evil. We don't want to expose kids to it. So now that Jeremy Boring has had the opportunity to boringly wax poetic about how Looney Tunes was real literature, let's take a look at Chip Chilla. Chip Chilla follows a family of chinchillas focusing on a young boy named Chip. His dad is voiced by Rob Schneider, who I'm guessing is either in debt or lost a bet to someone. Chip is homeschooled, which is never said directly in the show, but Jeremy Boring makes sure to mention it every chance he gets. And Chip gets a wonderful homeschooling experience because his parents supposedly literally never go to work. They just stay home and homeschool him and his siblings all day. How this family affords their home, I genuinely have no idea. Maybe the chinchilla economy is like socialist or something. Maybe they got chinchilla UBI. I have no idea. But anyway, the animation on the show is fine, if a bit simplistic and boring, especially compared to some of their other content like clangers. And the plots are okay for the most part, though we'll dive into that more in just a moment. But first, we need to talk about the chinchilla in the room. The fact that this show is basically a ripoff of the popular Australian cartoon Bluey. While on IMDb, The Daily Wire's original shows Mabel McClay and Gus Plus Us both have 9 out of 10 star averages, Chip Chilla lags behind with a rating of only 3.9 out of 10 stars. About a year ago, back in August of 2022, a tweet from user Benjamin JS read, The first Daily Wire cartoon show looks like it will finally answer the question, what if Bluey sucked? And it wasn't just a few random people online who noticed the similarities. Articles started flooding the internet asking whether Chip Chilla was meant to be what followed after parents said, we have Bluey at home. An article from Slate did a great job pointing out the key differences between the shows. There's what appears to be, at least from its primacy atop the app's home screen, Bent Key's pride and joy, the animated Chip Chilla. Put simply, Chip Chilla is Bent Key's attempt to do an American version of Bluey, the critical darling of contemporary children's entertainment which streams on Disney+. Plus. As in the Australia set Bluey, we have a nuclear family of animals, chinchillas, not dogs, living in a beautiful house, playing elaborate imaginative games with the help of a clever, caring father and mother. Even the color palette looks like Bluey's, though Chip himself is maybe two shades of blue darker than Bluey is. Well, it can't be a cheap knockoff if Chip is a whole two shades darker than Bluey is. Now it's a completely original idea. An article from The Guardian reported this past October, 
One of Bent Key's four original series is Chip Chilla, an animated show about a family of chinchillas who are homeschooled by their parents, voiced by embattled former Broadway actor Laura Osnes and actor and culture war warrior Rob Schneider. The pastel color palette bears a resemblance to a certain beloved Australian animated preschool series, and the three kids and parents in the series engage in elaborate roleplay. You'll notice the music in the teaser also rings distinct bluey bells. Bluey has been praised for being as moving and meaningful for parents as for kids, and importantly, for being funny. From the six episodes I've watched, I can say the worst sin Chip Chilla commits is being a bit dull, at least for this adult. If its mission, as suspected, is to take Bluey's winning formula and put a conservative wash on it, it's subtle. Take gender roles, for instance. While Chili, the mother in Bluey, is engaged outside the home with work, the father, Bandage, is an active and relatively equal caregiver to the two kids. The parents in Chip Chilla, meanwhile, embody more traditional roles. The mother, Chinny, voiced by Osnes, does a lot of the feeding, nurturing, and affection giving, while the distinctly alpha father, Chum Chum, Schneider leads the charge while Chinny assists in teaching topics such as Frankenstein, the Three Musketeers, and America's heroic role in the moon landing. Sorry, I, I just still can't get over the fact that the mother in Bluey is named Chili and the mother in Chip Chilla is named Chinny. They, they really didn't try. And we'll get a little deeper into the discussion of gender roles like that article was mentioning in just a moment once we're done talking about all the ways that this show directly copied Bluey. A YouTube channel called B&B &B Productions, which seems to do movie and TV reviews with a lot of videos focusing on analysis of Bluey, uploaded a video last month called Why Is This Bluey Ripoff Getting So Much Hate? And upon watching the episodes themselves, the show, and especially its art style, seemed to have some, let's just say, very familiar details. It's basically just Bluey, but worse. Well, kind of. Because there are a few differences, like there's three kids instead of two, and instead of being a girl, the protagonist is a boy. As the whole thing about a wholesome animal family, reenacting stories, and playing games is there, but all of the creativity, raw emotion, and mature takes on life Bluey has that got audiences so hooked really isn't. I should address the elephant in the room, which is that the art style looks suspiciously familiar. Like, okay, it could be a coincidence, but the appealing and natural pastels, along with everything being made of these rounded off rectangles and circles, really does remind you of another, better show. I mean, even the layout of their dining table is spot on, all of which is especially funny as early on, the show was clearly meant to have a different style, but for some reason they changed it. And I feel like even a couple of the jokes and scenes are oddly familiar, such as one scene where the dad eats a giant meal made by the kids and get sick, or an episode with a grumpy senior at a garage sale. So yeah, that, that sounds like a knockoff. A show that's meant to look like Bluey from a distance so that it tricks kids too young to know the difference or that parents might see as a valuable substitute. But as a knockoff often does, it lacks a lot of the quality that viewers know Bluey for providing. And that lack of quality might be easily explained by one thing the working conditions. One of the top comments on that B&B &B Productions video comes from a user who allegedly worked on the animation of the show. As the comment says, not proud to say this, but I actually worked on the show. The animation company I worked for took this project on, but our boss didn't tell us they were Daily Wire until a few episodes in. Right away, the animators and I said the show is basically bluey, but didn't complain too much. Now, the characters themselves weren't the issue. This show was hell to work on. We were not given proper assets or props, and a lot of backgrounds had to be manually fixed by the animators. We were also not given walk cycles, hand poses, or anything of the sort. We had to do all that by ourselves, which was not told to us until problems started to arise. The animators worked overtime, the clients were extremely picky and constantly told us the wrong things, and will change their minds weeks into the animation process. Everyone on my team hated working on this show, and we only found joy in the strange glitches and rig breaks that happened. Basically, we got the shit end of the stick when working on this show, and I am so glad that it is over. Now, okay, Savvy, you might be thinking, so Chip Chilla is a lame knockoff of a better show, and it also was zero fun to produce, and it's also created by a company that Ben Shapiro owns. All of that sucks. Sir, what about the show? If the show itself is good, then does any of that have to matter? After all, isn't there no ethical consumption under capitalism? Well, that whole rabbit hole aside, yeah, let's talk about the content of the show itself. At first glance, the show doesn't appear to be blatant conservative propaganda in any way. Thankfully, it's nothing like those PragerU kids cartoons. But that all changed a few years ago when left-wing writers took over the comic strip 
and had Superman renounce his American citizenship to be a citizen of the world. It doesn't try to hit you over the head with messages about Columbus enslaving people being fine as long as he didn't eat them or shove privatized healthcare propaganda down your throat. Eat it. Much like Jeremy Boring claims, the show is largely apolitical. He was fairly honest when he said that. But we also have to keep the bigger picture in mind. This is a streaming service that Daily Wire is promoting as an alternative to Disney+. Plus. Jeremy has told us time and time again that being homeschooled is a huge part of these chinchillas' identities. When you put all that together, it kind of seems like the streaming service is meant to be the only thing you give to your kids. If your kids want to watch Chip Chilla in addition to Bluey or to any more educational or substantial content, okay. But if this ad is being promoted as an alternative, we do kind of need to look at the life that Chip Chilla is normalizing. Because if it's fair for the Daily Wire to say it's woke just to show LGBTQ people existing on TV, then I'm allowed to claim that it's equally political to only show straight people or to only show typical nuclear families with historically traditional gender roles. You make very compelling argument. As the article I mentioned earlier pointed out, Chip Chilla, even though it's a show where both parents presumably don't have to work for some reason, is still steeped in the traditional gender roles of the father as the leader and the mother as the subordinate. Take episode two, for example. Episode two is called Extra Extra, and it involves the Chinchilla parents giving their kids a homeschooled assignment to learn about reporting. They have to gather local news and make a newspaper. However, the kids quickly start treating gossip and tattling as real news. Chip's older sister, Charla, runs a whole article about how Chip won't put away his laundry, for example. Throughout the episode, the chinchillas have to learn how to spot worthy news stories instead of just giving into gossip and tattling. Okay, and Chip, put away the laundry. Charla, don't be a tattletale. It's not your job to tell me these things. Oh, so I shouldn't tell you anything? Why is Chip drawing on the wall? What if he's on the roof? Why are my two ace reporters standing around? I need to wear another shoe leather. Give me stories. So, couple questions here. First, is this supposed to be some kind of message about real news versus fake news? And second, since this episode regularly demonizes tattling, is Chip Chilla really making the argument that snitches get stitches? I hope these kids grow up to remember that message before they think to call the cops on their neighbors. I'm just saying. Actually, third question, since both of the parents are at home, why is mom doing all the work of feeding the baby while dad chills behind the newspaper making judgmental remarks? The show constantly portrays women as always doing the overwhelming majority of domestic labor even when neither parent is at work. Anyway, even in this episode where all chinchilla children regardless of gender are doing the same assignment, the parents still have to categorize themselves as a male leader and a female follower. Chinny, hold my calls. I'm gonna walk and talk with these two. Certainly, Chief. And that's where you two Cracker Jack reporters come in. I need you to find me news stories worth printing. You got it? Of course, Dad's the boss and Mom's the secretary, but Savvy, you might be thinking, maybe you're reading too deeply into this. Maybe she's just trying to do a little film noir reference. Maybe it's not that deep. And I'd agree if we didn't get this clip just a couple seconds later. I don't know, maybe it's just about using your judgment. Oh, but what do I know? I'm just a secretary. So get out there and find me some stories. But what do I know? I'm just a secretary. Yeah, it's a joke. It's not meant to be taken seriously, but the joke relies on the background assumption that a secretary is a lesser role. The joke is that the secretary had the right answer, but it's funny because the secretary isn't supposed to be the one with the knowledge. I'm not saying that mom and dad should have necessarily switched roles, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with casting the mom as the secretary. I'm saying that it's part of an overall pattern of the very specific things that Chip Chilla normalizes. Yes, yes, pattern, pattern. Turn. My friend Pat took a turn. And portraying that as apolitical. Because when Jeremy and Ben's rose-colored filters of the past through the lens of restorative nostalgia, things that were their normal can't be political. They're just normal. Because for them, their experience is the default. They consider themselves to be the standard, and any experience outside of their own is what's political. I guess we should probably talk about their uh, biggest... Thing that they're the promoting flagship. the flagship yeah. their one like big original show that they created they did not just buy from somebody else the one they're selling all the merch for on the daily wire website right now which is i almost called it bluey again it is chip no I, I i i've watched the whole show in some yeah. episodes multiple times now and i still like find myself yeah. almost calling it bluey that's the one i've watched the most of i've watched almost all the episodes of that and it's it's not good it's really it's no. so boring it's not good it's very like it it does this thing because a, a lot of them and Gus plus us does this too where they have like little in jokes that are you know yeah. they're they're for the parents but the ones in chip chilla are so like stale and broad and yeah. 
like even as a parent you know obviously it's it's meant to be entertainment for kids but i can't imagine it becoming like the the show that parents don't mind watching when, right when their kid likes to watch it um i think that it's a show that if i were a parent i would really not not be into chip chill at time right well because that's the thing if i had kids and my kids were like we're gonna watch uh we're gonna watch clangers we're gonna watch mabel mcclay i would be like okay i'll watch that if they're gonna be like we're gonna watch another episode of chip chilla i would get a headache at this point the show is a is a headache inducing so this is the big one that they're promoting when i first started watching chip chilla i didn't think it was that bad and the reason being it was the first show i watched on this channel and i was comparing it to like the dennis prager kids content because that's what i'd watched before and i was like all right is this gonna be all about why like christopher Better columbus and slaving twins. people yeah. yeah is it like is it gonna be like slavery at least it's not as bad as cannibalism is it gonna be like weird shit like that or is it gonna be like the tuttle twins where they just like listen to old people lecture them about capitalist philosophy <laughs> or like no it wasn't like that so at first i was like okay the show has animated characters it has jokes it has plots oh wow we're we're already in a whole different league <laughs> but then we can break it down it's an extremely annoying show about a whiny little chinchilla and his family and I guess they're supposed to be all homeschooled. I don't remember if they ever mentioned that, but I think I've seen Jeremy Boring talk about how they're homeschooled, like canonically, I guess. And it's all about all the different activities that the parents and the kids do together to learn things. Which, and it, it is like pretty apolitical. There's there's one like stranger danger lesson that I feel goes completely unrecognized in a later episode that I'll, I'll get to in a second. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the issues are less with any inherent politics than just like the fact that it is a bluey knockoff, but also Chip as a character is like the catalyst for almost everything that goes wrong because, which is like, it's fine to have that in certain, I think Gus Plus Us does that really yeah. well, where in some episodes, some of the characters will be like, oh my gosh, I lied. I don't know why I did that. And that becomes the the plot device to yeah. teach kids about, oh, this is why you shouldn't lie. This is yeah. why it's better to tell the truth. But not only is Chip like 99% of the problem in here, but he never seems to like learn a lesson. And it, it, he is always just like so conceited and spoiled until something magically solves the the problem. And then the next episode, he just goes back to being conceited and spoiled again. And it's it is a very annoying dynamic to watch. He's like Caillou, um, dude. He's more like Caillou. Oh than my Bluey. gosh, absolutely. <laughs> Except that he's fuzzy instead of bald, but he's got the Caillou, like, I'll whine about my problems until someone else fixes it for me kind of energy the whole time. And I, I also, like, I think the voice cast is, like, fine. It has Rob Schneider, who appears to be d doing his damnedest in this. He gives a annoyingly serviceable performance but i think a bigger problem is that it's a show that never not that you know kids shows need to be slow and melodramatic or anything but it is a show that is on a constant caffeine rush yes like it is it is from the first frame to the last like just go 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 we have to have as many like wacky hijinks going on maybe throw some factoids in at kids that they and references to books that they definitely won't understand like yes. half of the episodes are also just weird adaptations of classical literature too which is a very like the way that they do it also sometimes misses the point of like the themes that they were going for yeah um, it's just a it's a haphazardly put together piece of media that i cannot see kids getting super into when something like bluey exists right now what were your thoughts on the episode where not bluey chip where chip's older sister is president and has to learn about peaceful transfer of power. That was the one that kind of, I was like, where they go? I don't know what they're going for with this. Yeah, that one was really weird. And I, I have a number of notes I've written down on it too, because it starts out and I almost like, like it starts out as kind of like, you know, like, oh, this is why George Washington was such a great president because he put down leadership because he didn't want uh, to become a tyrant and all that stuff. Yeah. And it, it like for half a second, it feels like if somebody like if this was like a purely like centrist liberal show and they were going to do like an episode vaguely alluding to Trump or something like it it had that feeling of like, are they going to talk about like, oh, it's a good thing to to give up power when the time comes and let democracies speak for the people. Uh, but they also like they don't follow it through because any lessons there become just completely embroiled in like the family dynamic. Yeah. 
And the other half of that is that they don't ever talk about like the the way that they depict a president in the show is basically a king. Yeah, the president is like a dictator with complete power. Like when when uh, Chip's sister is president, she's like, no rules. We do whatever we want. Uh And then everyone starts to get sick of it. And she's like, all right, now everyone has to do what I say. And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, so we're having a chinchilla revolution in this house is that what's happening and then eventually she's like i'm sick of this someone else can be president now and i'm like what what is this meant to teach as i was watching it the thing that really got me is that like it is a missed opportunity to teach kids how like the three branches of government actually work because you have a very easy setup to be like okay you can be the president but here's how the legislative and the executive work and here's how like a check and balance of power works so that you can't just you know, take over control. Like it, I I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, like aside from a, aside from personal conspiracy about like why they wouldn't want to teach kids about balances of powers in the U.S. government. Like it, it just felt like a weirdly missed opportunity yeah. and an oversimplification of a concept that like I I understood as a kid. I remember learning about the division of power and the three branches and all that stuff. Yeah, I did too. I did too. So yeah, it, the the show, I think you bring up a good point about how the fact that it's like trying to teach these lessons to apply in the real world, but the show is so focused on the dynamics of the Chinchilla family and nothing else. So there's this one where they the the Chinchilla kids have to become newspaper reporters and then they start gossiping about everybody, which is a a, a normal like TV show episode. I've seen a premise like that before in other shows, like that's good. But then that's when I notice like the whole neighborhood starts to get involved. They start to report on other people and things like that and, and learn that lesson. But beyond that, for the most part, it's kind of like everything is within the Chinchilla family. And, well, and the, yeah, that episode is super interesting too, because that's one that I was like, that's another one that if you wanted to read an ideological angle to it, so much of that episode could be seen as like just teaching kids an early lesson on like, oh, you can't trust the news. Like, because it, it literally is a life lesson about like fake news and such. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it, it like, if I'm being charitable to it, I can look at it and and say like, okay, maybe it's about like, don't trust the, the gossip tabloids. Don't trust the, you know, the the celebrity magazines or things like that. Because a lot of the the news that's like the tattling instead of the real news were stories about like, oh, Chip didn't put away his laundry or like, you know, gossip about about the family and other people in their neighborhood. And that's what they find is bad. So like, on the one hand, like if I'm going to be charitable to the show, if I hadn't gone into this with the knowledge that Daily Wire produced the show, I probably wouldn't be thinking that hard about it. So I also want to make sure I like look at it objectively. So I, I, I don't know. But overall, Chip Chilla, if we're looking at it as like, would kids watch this as an alternative to Bluey? No. It's, it's given a, way, a choice, absolutely not. It's a no. way worse show. So when I'm thinking about it, the only context that I could see kids watching this as an alternative is if their parents get only this streaming service and they say, okay, you know what? All the media out there is too woke. All of the media is going to damage your brain. So the only streaming service we're getting is the Daily Wire Bent Key Productions service. And if this is the only things you're letting your kids watch, I w- then I would say, oh, no, 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 this is not substantial enough. None of this is. No, and and I like I wanted to talk about really quick the, the yard sale episode because there's oh, yeah. an entire episode where chip goes off and it's about him you know learning that old things can have value too and also kind of not to judge a book by its cover and he his family's at a yard sale and he can't find anything he really likes and an old guy who loves dinosaurs and is like a paleontologist invites him over to his garage and chip just go like it's all well and good to not like you know turn it into a story about like being predatory or anything yeah but chip literally is lured into this man's home is over there for, you know, it's never specified how long, but long enough that his parents notice he's missing and then Chip just like comes back without a problem. And and for for the demographic that this is aimed at specifically, like so, so young, so, so impressionable, you know, will try and act out the weirdest things that they'll see on TV. I feel like not having any acknowledgement of even the parents saying like, hey, don't go running off like that. You shouldn't go off with with strangers like that. Something bad, like we were worried about you. Like they don't say any of that stuff. It's never brought up. And I feel like that is like, it's it's a one-off thing, but I feel like that is a kind of gross shirking of, of 
responsibility when you're writing children's media almost especially for a brand that's whole thing is like you have to be homeschooled because the teachers are going to be predators the teachers are going to try to groom you if you go to public school so it's important that you have to be homeschooled however in our homeschool show that we're making we're also going to have the kids just go over to another adult's house unsupervised when they're a little tiny child and their parents don't know where they are so I'm like, what? Yeah. what is the actual message here? Are we supposed to be afraid of all adults because all adults other than our parents are are scary? Or does it really not matter? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Yeah, which I, I feel like it was there. just a case of like, they, like the they writers didn't, didn't think, think through. It was which, just lazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like a lot of those things and, and a lot of like the conflicts and stuff get wrapped up very, and it, you know, I'm not expecting complicated art from a, from a kid show, but like they get wrapped up in such a convenient way. Like it'll just like deus ex machina itself out and all of a sudden everybody's hugging and everybody's having a good time. And it's, I I feel like it is definitely a show that doesn't take the intelligence of kids into account, which Mm -hmm. is, which is probably it's, it's biggest problem, but to, to go to what you were saying about like parents who only have this as their streaming services, I think that is kind of, the the end goal for a lot of the daily wire the other two new daily wire original shows kid explorer and kid fit go are basically just glorified youtube channels uploaded behind a paywall kid explorer is about a kid who teaches us history from behind a news desk for a web show the settings the costumes the editing they're pretty well done. If I saw this on YouTube, I'd honestly be impressed. But as one of only five pieces of original new programming on a paid streaming service, no, this show is not that great. This show is honestly the one that gets the most political. Take the episode about the founding fathers of the US, for example. Yeah, all kids have to learn about the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, and the US separating itself as a country no longer under British rule. Telling someone the facts isn't political. But inserting your opinion is. And just to be clear, I'm not out here to say everything about the U.S. sucks. This country's awful in every way. I hate where I live. One, I don't believe that in every case. And two, that would be a political statement in and of itself. Just as it's also political to intentionally frame everything about the U.S. as positive and good in all circumstances. So let's take a look at a couple clips from Kid Explorer. The American colonists were all subjected to the crazy rules enforced by King George. Who didn't even live on the land. And one of those rules was putting a super high tax on just about everything. Taxes are fees that people have to pay the government so that it can afford the cost of things that benefit the community where the taxpayers live. Now, ideally, the government wouldn't go crazy. Imagine if there were a king that ruled over the neighborhood you and your family lived in. And what if you had a lemonade stand where you sold delicious refreshments to your neighbors? And one day, the king of your neighborhood dropped by and said, hey, you owe me most of that money you just made. Because I said so. They began seeing themselves as visionaries, defenders of freedom, patriots. A nation that would create opportunities and foster so much growth that it would eventually become a global superpower with one of the strongest economies, militaries, and impact on culture that the world has ever seen. A nation that people all around the world see as the land of opportunity. So first of all, please do not take a shot every time that kid says freedom or you might fall into the Boston Harbor yourself. Beyond all the ass kissing for the founding father, others as visionaries who created a world that was free and equal for all, with no mention of the fact that votes were exclusively for wealthy white men. But that's beside the point, I guess. But on top of that, the show fails as an educational resource. Out of all the new material on Bent Key, this show is by far the most directly educational. It has a kid telling us facts about history, and each episode takes us through a different topic. Each episode is meant to be factual and educational, and yet it's not. Let's take a look at the way our friend Broadcast Cal defines tyranny, for example. Imagine your five-year-old child just watched that. Do you think they now have an understanding of what tyranny is? from that definition. Just a tyrant! Hey mom, what's tyranny? Oh, it's when a person or institution in power becomes oppressive and starts limiting the freedoms of the very people they're supposed to serve. So, uh, you're a tyrant, huh? What does oppressive mean? What does limiting the freedoms mean? Who are the people they're supposed to serve? I'm not saying that kids aren't capable of understanding this concept. I'm saying that this particular definition, without any additional examples to compare it to, without breaking it down, without explaining what some of those terms mean within this context, that's not going to give kids an understanding of what tyranny is. Let's take a look at the way this show introduces kids to taxes. Fees that people have to pay the government so that it can afford the cost of things that benefit the community where taxpayers live. Yeah, that's true. There's nothing wrong with that definition, but it's not going to do much if you're a child who has literally never heard of the entire concept of taxes before. The cost of what things? 
What are some examples of things that benefit the community? Now, I'm sure we could all think of many examples, but where's the discussion for the kids to start thinking of those examples? Why is this video so short and so fast when it could slow down and actually fully introduce these concepts? Also, I love the lemonade stand bit where the king character is just basically every existing local government that charges income and sales taxes. Yeah, if you're selling things to other people, if you're running a business that exists on a full scale, you're going to have to pay sales tax and you're going to pay income income tax. That's not tyranny, that's just regular life. So anyway, Kid Explorer sucks, but we have saved by far the worst show for last. It's time to talk about the absolute train wreck that is Kid Fit Go. So we have two shows from a wonderful family down in Georgia called Kid Explorer and uh, Kid Fit Go. And these are live action shows hosted by kids for kids. And they're, they're funny and they're um, practical. You know, Kid Fit Go, for example, kids will learn how to do exercise by doing exercise with other kids. Because part of being a well-rounded human is not just being exposed to good ideas, but to good discipline, to good habits. And so, you know, that's an important part of what we're doing with the show. Kid Fit Go is a show that takes the most boring parts of gym class and pretends that they're entertaining. Kid Fit Go is a show that introduces you to the cardio workouts that adults put off doing because they claim cardio is going to lessen their gains, but in reality they're just putting it off because the exercises are so boring and they'd rather spend their time lifting. So I think we can all agree that kids being active is a good thing. And when you're a high energy kid, thankfully, there are lots of ways to get your body moving. Maybe you'll join a local sports team. Maybe you'll sign up for a martial arts class. Maybe you'll play tag in your best friend's backyard. Maybe you'll play on the playground at recess. Maybe you'll learn to dance. Or maybe you'll watch a hit cardio tutorial on the Daily Wire Kids app, which is basically every fitness influencer's free lead magnet on YouTube, except this time starring kids. Lower your body down toward the ground by bending your elbows. Keep your back straight and your core engaged. Once your chest hits the ground, push yourself up back to the starting position. That's right. Kid Fit Go is just dumbed down circuit training. Not only are there about a million and a half free YouTube videos of these exact workouts available already, but who would even watch this? Imagine you're a parent and you care that your kid is active and gets enough physical activity. Now, if your kid is already someone who's active and loves to move around, chances are you've already enrolled them in a sport of some kind, whether that's through putting them in a local sports league or through encouraging them to meet up with their friends on the basketball court or taking them to the school gym to play sports. But let's say you have a kid who's not that into sports. Your kid is a cute little bookworm whose favorite hobbies are all sedentary. How do you encourage them to be more active. Do you A, take them to the park and supervise them having fun playing frisbee with the dog, B, encourage them to invite their friends over to play a game in the yard like sharks and minnows, C, take a nice mile-long walk together as a family every day to enjoy the fresh air, or D, download the Daily Wire Kids app, pay Ben Shapiro $100, and show your kids a bunch of hit cardio tutorials that even most athletic adults would find mind-numbingly boring, force them to do these workouts multiple times a week until they're so bored out of their mind that they decide they hate all forms of fitness and athleticism and grow up to be weak, sedentary little life forms. I have now, I'm not a parent, so my opinion doesn't mean shit, but I sure as hell would not choose option D. Kid Fit Go actually leads to a much bigger discussion about one of the basic failures of BentKey as a streaming service. Who is it for? Ben Shapiro sings the praises of capitalism daily. He knows the free market like the back of his hand. The dude loves a good, oversimplified supply and demand chart. So of course, when launching a service that he's admitted to investing tens of millions of dollars into, of course he has to know who the target customer is, right? Well, let's talk about that. I, I don't know how much appeal their content has to preteens, to the, the kind of slightly older Saturday morning cartoon demographic that I think they're also trying to go after. They are, because that's the thing is all, this is where the, I think the target audience gets a little confused here because all the advertisements I have seen for this, where you see like interviews with Jeremy Boring talking about things, they say that they want this to be an alternative to Disney because they're mad at Disney because Disney spoke out against Ron DeSantis. And like, there's a, I, I did a whole video on that thing, but now they're mad at Disney because all of this is like some kind of weird, like alliance shit. So they're mad at Disney. So they're like, we're going to create an alternative to Disney, which is like, on the one hand, I'll give you props for instead of just complaining about something, actually creating something like that's cool. I'll give you props for that. But at the same time, I don't think this is an alternative to Disney. Does Disney reaches a much wider age range? But what I do notice is that the overwhelming majority of these shows seem to be a direct knockoff of something else. 
And I think that that's yeah. an important thing to talk about too, because and, they, if they're trying to be like an alternative, I can see where that is because a lot of these are like, this is a knockoff of this other show when I don't even know why they wouldn't necessarily want their kid watching the other show, but I guess they just want to monopolize the market or something, but they, there are a lot of knockoffs on here. Well, and I think a, a lot of people, we've already talked about how Mabel McClay is kind of like Mr. Rogers. Yeah. I think something like Gus Plus Us is kind of in that same range. And then you have something like, I was going to, I was about to say Bluey. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is, is yeah, yeah Chip Chilla, um, Chip Chilla, the is, Bluey knockoff, and that's that's I feel like that's all anybody really has been talking about it as, uh, and it's it's true, like it is very like stylistically in terms of the like the family dynamic, the the plotting, like it's very similar, and I guess like that's understandable. You want to you want to have that equivalent for something as successful as Bluey, but it does speak to I think a lack of just general innovation even their their big like ooh coming to bent key their their feature film of the the snow white and the evil witch is like it's it's you know it's snow white it's like there's it's not something that they came up with themselves i'll have to put a clip in my video of this but there is i believe it's jeremy boring who is in an interview talking about how they cho- they're making the snow white movie solely because disney's currently making a snow white movie like it's they're they're only doing it because when Disney's movie comes out, they want to provide competition, which is, you know, a thing you can do in the free market society we live in. You can do that. But it's also like there is no creativity here. There, And I, I to be honest, like, I think Disney needs to stop making the live action remakes like they're stupid. I don't enjoy them. So I don't think Disney's using any creativity either. I think they're like, oh, let's not let our uh, rights to this expire. Let's put out something new real quick. So I don't think there's anything valid in that either. But now they're like doing a something they're making just to compete with something that's already being made as a cash grab. It's just, I, I, I think it looks terrible. Honestly. It really does. And, and here's the funny thing is that Jeremy Boring was one of the people who got really mad about there was, it went around last year of a group of, it was, it was a production photo of the Disney Snow White remake that had like a person of color and it had uh, right. people of like different genders and ethnicities. And I think what ended up happening is people assumed that those were the new seven dwarfs, but what has actually come out is that they are not, that is, those are a different group of people in the Disney remake. So Jeremy Boring has been nonstop talking about how, you know, woke and terrible the new Snow White is going to be. And it's all kind of, I think, based on that, which, I don't think he was even right about to begin with. I have to I have to go check up on that. But I I believe it was like completely disingenuous from the start. Yes, it was. So that's I think that looks like the worst thing by far. But mm-hmm. I haven't it's not out yet, so I can't see it yet. It's it's coming in 2024. I guess we'll have to wait and see. And that that kind of also speaks to how they've been doling out content for this, because like, like we said, they have a whole bunch of stuff that's that they licensed, whether it's yeah. from a lot of it's from like European animation studios. So it's stuff that hasn't really been on Netflix here, but it might have an English dub so they can kind of just plop it out there. The the main like their their daily wire content, their their bent key essentials, they do a new episodes weekly, but they haven't been consistent in those. And also like some of the episodes like we we're talking about Kid Explorer. Kid Explorer was based on a YouTube channel that got to start like four or five years ago. And from what I understand, like the the kid's parents have him and his siblings kind of doing these like vaguely educational edutainment, like in front of a, a video camera things. And they're they're totally fine. I think the ones they did exclusively for Bent Key get into some gnarly historical like revisionism and <laughs> overlooking. That's a separate, separate issue. Yeah. But like one of the new things that they just uploaded as a exclusive episode it's just a re-upload of a kid explorer youtube short from like four years ago that's not new like you could just watch that for free on youtube like that's not why would you pay for that yeah yeah and it like it's i think it speaks to just their general dearth of content because I I don't know how many people like want to work with them. I don't know how many people would be like excited outside of people like trying to get their own kid shows made. Like how many people would be excited to really like, oh my gosh, I got to get on this Daily Wire platform when they could take that to Netflix or Hulu or any other number of 
places. At the end of the day, this service is a product to be sold. Using the very basic free market concept of competition, this app has to offer something more than Disney, th than Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu or any other streaming app that parents could choose to buy instead. So why does it contain so little content? Why are there only five original shows with only about 15 other shows in, in total licensed from YouTubers and European animation studios? When you have other streaming services offering hundreds or thousands of different shows in movies, why would anyone pay $100 a year, which is on par with the price of a lot of streaming services, to get so much less? The only reason I can think is that the streaming service itself isn't actually the product. Ben Shapiro is the product. The Daily Wire is the product. And more importantly, fear is the product. You must not fear. And fear is the mind killer. The fear of every other streaming service being infiltrated by leftists. The fear of outside influences teaching your children things that might make them turn out different from you. The fear that your children are going to grow up one day and develop minds of their own and you won't be able to control them forever. And when they become their own autonomous beings, you'll start to realize that your purpose as a parent is starting to expire. And because of that, you're only inching closer to becoming confronted with your own mortality. Death is all around us. That is the product. They're not selling entertainment, they're selling fear. And fear is an emotion. And as Ben Shapiro himself says, facts don't care about your feelings. Now, there's been one question that I haven't answered yet. A question that's been on my mind for a while and might be on yours as well. Why is it called Bent Key? What does that even mean? Why the name Bent Key? Why not DW Kids, as we've been calling the initiative for the last year? Well, put simply, DW Kids is just too political. Bent Key isn't about teaching kids politics. It's about childhood and wonder and adventure. It's about values and all of the things on which politics are built later. We didn't just come up with a new name though. We built an entirely new app that's available on all the most popular devices. I love how he started with why Bentley and then never actually explains the name. Why don't we start with the first question? What the hell is Bent Key? Where did the term Bent Key come from? I know this question has been asked you a thousand times because you literally wear a Bent Key around your neck and have ever since I have known you. But where, where does that even come from? Yeah, so I wear every day for the last 28 years, I've had this bent key around my neck. And it's the key to a small theater in a town called Post, Texas, where I grew up doing doing plays and where I kind of discovered who I was and what I wanted to do in life. And it bent in the lock one day. You know, the, the full story of that is probably not one for uh, not one for this conversation. It's one for, you know, when there's bourbon around and cigars and long hours late into the evening. But uh, it bent in the lock and it and I put it on a, on a string because it sort of represented this important period in my life where I was being trusted with responsibility for the first time, where I was associating with adults for the first time, where I was sort of discovering who I am and what I believe and what I wanted to do with my life for the first time. Okay, sorry, Jeremy, I want to be clear on that. You named your company after a story that you can't tell in mixed company because it's inappropriate, because it's really the kind of story you tell over bourbon and cigars. But you thought that would be a great name for your kids app? The app that's supposed to protect kids from all adult themes and influences is one you named after a story that you can only tell to adults. Why? People who haven't started businesses may not know, it's really hard to find any word or two word combination to use for your business that isn't already trademarked, that isn't already owned by someone. And so after we'd gone through like 30 names one day and we we're completely exhausted, we we're like, what's something that certainly no one would have used? It's like, well, bent key, it's not even a real thing. So we used it. Yeah, funny you should say that, you know, about how hard it is to find a name that hasn't already been claimed or trademarked. Because believe it or not, there actually is another company called Bent Key that already exists. And it's my kind of company. It's a small business. It's a book publisher. It's a small press owned by LGBTQ women publishing books with diverse representation from across all the gender, racial, and LGBTQ spectrums. When I was in the process of researching for this video, I talked with a woman named Rebecca Kenny, who is the founder of a small press called Bent Key Publishing, who never expected to end up in a trademark race with Ben Shapiro. It's such a, it's such a bit of bad luck for us because my company, Bent Key, is a tiny little teeny indie press. We're based in the UK. Um, and it's one of those names that you just don't expect anybody else to use. It's it's bent key. It means nothing to most people. It has very special meaning to me, uh, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, when I found out about it, what... <laughs> The, the ridiculous part of it is that they stand for literally everything that we do not stand for. 
they are the absolute anathema to what we represent in our bent key. We're bent key with a space in the middle. Our At least writers, there's a little difference there, yeah. Difference. Our writers are, I mean, we're queer run, we're disabled run. A lot a lot of our writers are trans, non-binary, um, disabled, black or brown, marginalised in, in any number of different ways. And that we exist to kind of amplify those voices and those authentic stories. And for me, our name is so good for us because we're all kind of little bent keys we don't quite fit into the locks of society we have trouble kind of fitting in anywhere and our community is one that exists to welcome people who don't feel like they quite fit in and so it was a little bit disconcerting to find that a right-wing outlet kind of hijacked our name because it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense it's such an odd name to choose for what they want to achieve especially because here in the UK to be bent is a, a pejorative term for being gay so we all we all like to joke that we're all a little bit bent because we're all queer it's like well. the opposite of straight right like, yeah. like yeah you're straight so, so they can be straight or it can be bent <laughs> yeah. so it's such an odd name to choose if you're like trying to promote a straight lifestyle and good christian values because why would you choose a word that in the uk over here but then i guess you had a president the daily name. wire does not know that the uk exists and i mean they know it exists but like they're not paying attention to anything so basically i was an english teacher for like 17 years i taught for a really long time and i was driving to work one morning i'd just gone back to full-time work after having my son and um and I lost control of my car around a country road. And I was in a quite a serious car smash. And I broke my neck, my back, my pelvis, my sternum, my sacrum. Oh my I ended up in a major trauma unit in Liverpool for about, was it close to two weeks? Had to learn to walk again, had to kind of recover over a period of nearly a year. And when I was in the hospital with it being COVID, I wasn't allowed any visitors. And it was the poetry community and the writing community that kind of kept me level and sane. And this all doesn't sound like it has anything to do with our name, but it does, I promise. And as I was leaving the hospital, when I've been in the hospital, I've been doing a little bit of writing with people and we've decided to turn it into a little pamphlet that we were going to sell to raise money for the hospital that had cared for me. And when we did that, we were like, we started talking about the idea of me putting a, a poetry collection out. And if I was going to do that, would I run it under a publishing company? And I wasn't doing a huge amount bar laying in bed and getting anticoagulant injections every now and then. And so we were chatting away about the name and what if we were going to do this, what was it going to be called? And my then partner brought up a bag when I'd got home from the hospital that they'd sent home with me. And it was my clothes that they cut off me when I was in the hospital and in my pocket because I had one of those cars with a push button it didn't start with a key it started with a button so my keys have been in my pocket and they've been in the pocket of the side that the car had smashed into because I've been t-boned right into where Ooh. I was sat and my front door key was in my pocket and it had bent like this and that's so I scary had, just the impact <laughs> of that yeah and I had a conversation, I posted the picture of the key on Instagram and I had a conversation with a friend of mine called Anthony Schmerick, this incredible poet and musician. And he just sent me a message and he said, that key is never going to work again. Look at the state of it. And you are still here. Like, that's incredible. And so for me, it was like Ben Key became this little symbol of kind of resistance and survival and beating the odds and living even though the world kind of wants you not to and that's why for me it's so heartbreaking to hear them just go oh it's just a name it's just a name for us because for me and for everybody that that writes for us it has that really special meaning of every one of us that that writes for Benke has, has had some kind of trauma or horrendous event happen in their past and everybody relates to my story in some way or another, even if it's not a physical thing. Everybody's got their own big tale of where their life changed irrevocably. And that's what the Benke represents. And so for me, that's why it was so heartbreaking to see it kind of used in such a flippant way. 
Well, because for you, there's this whole like theme of resilience. There's this whole idea that like the key was bent and it takes a lot to to bend a yeah. key. They're, they're solid, <laughs> right? But you survived and you as a human were able to survive and overcome that. And that's that's a really symbolic meaning. Whereas like, there's no real symbolic meaning to it that I can gather whatsoever from the Daily Wire's cartoons <laughs> and kids stuff. It's just a, a name that's... And so... I kind of i i want to i want to reclaim this in the public consciousness. I want people to hear Ben Keen think of you guys first, not them. And I'm wondering, like, has this been stressful in terms of like SEO? Because like, at first, my first thought is like, okay, this is a U.S. specific service. I mean, I guess theoretically, people from other countries could pay for the streaming service too. But like, it's really targeted at the U.S. And you're in the U.K. and your audience is primarily in the U.K. as well. Are you worried about confusion, about SEO, about like them taking over your Google search rank? Like what, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of thoughts uh, or things have come into mind as this, as this has happened? It's something that we're still kind of seeing the effects of because obviously it's not been a huge thing in, in England. Mm-hmm. We have shifted a little bit down the Google algorithm. But for me, the people who want to find us are going to find us. We have a we have a, a really strong social media presence. We have an author releasing a collection in the US in January. So we are gaining traction over there. We've been trading in America since February 2022, since long before the other bank key registered. In a way, I kind of like that anybody searching for bank key, that bank key is going to find our little queer, different, radical, left-wing resistance group of writers. And I like the idea that anybody kind of going through that search is going to pop up and find us. And we've actually had some interactions, which have been quite nice on Twitter, which haven't started off nice because people have been tagging us in because they don't have a handle on, well, it's X now, isn't it? Uh, But then when I've messaged them and gone, oh, that's not us. We stand for everything. Oh, they like tag you instead of yeah. instead of them. That's gonna be annoying to get uh to get yeah, but then <laughs> it's kind of like all all press is good press, right? I've got really good at yeah. not reading comments and not not listening to people who just wanna rant about how you know gender euphoria isn't real and we're all just talentless millennials I've got quite used to filtering that out now so I've actually had some really nice conversations with people who tagged us in and then I've gone that's not us we actually stand for complete opposite of what you think Benki is and then that's led to a really lovely discussion of well actually what do you stand for well have a look this, this is what we make it's it's polar opposite and actually, you'll probably quite like it if you're posting against the Daily Wire. And then that's in it, in itself then led to sales, which has been quite nice. You operate in different countries. So I would hope that that would help. But are you guys are in the process. Are you guys getting like a trademark or something or that kind yeah. of thing going? Yeah, it's a little bit frustrating. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a legal maze because we applied for our trademark. We crowdfunded for our trademark, which was amazing. We raised raised the money to trademark the company in like 48 hours which was amazing just such a a great show of community and we put in for our trademark and then they put in for their trademark two days after we put in for ours no that's so bad but because they've already registered in america they are given priority over me because oh so they are registering the trademark in the uk too yeah so it opens up this kind of can of worms in that they've registered for their trademark and so we're technically after them but the US is a first to use not a first to file state and we were the first to use the name in commerce in America we sold our first book to America in February 2022 and they didn't file their name until August 2022 so there's a lot of kind of difficult arguments to be had but there's there's no telling who technically came first it's it's to do with kind of rules and regulations in the UK and America and they had this kind of special relationship in commerce and trademarking but then they're completely different at the same time so we're in a kind of wait and see period at the minute where our trademark application is now in the journal it's got two months to be um, opposed by the other bank key in which case they might oppose it they might just let it go and we're just waiting and seeing. And we've been pondering alternate names in the meantime, just in case. 
Well, you guys shouldn't have to have an alternate name. That would be because the name already has so much significance and your brand existed first, like <laughs> with the name Bent Key, like they they w didn't launch this until just recently, whereas you guys already had that name. So I don't know the specifics of trademark law, let alone the intricacies of how it's different in the US versus in the UK. But I, I hope that everything goes well for you guys in that process. And I almost want to see like, some kind of movie about this like <laughs> you've got like the the u.s you got this big company with uh, all this yeah. big money behind it that's trying to take the trademark and then you guys who are like the the small business this group of creatives <laughs> who are trying to fight back like and you got to figure out the specific bat like it's like the perfect setup for some kind of movie or something <laughs> maybe it could be a, a a piece of writing you guys do in the future oh my god uh, a book about it the bent, bent key battle <laughs> It's such a David and Goliath story. And I was like, yeah. you know, I, when I set all this up, I was like, oh, we've got such a weird name. We're never going to have to worry about this. It's such a weird name. No one's going to want that name. And so I never trademarked it, which was, with hindsight, a silly thing to do. But it's just such an unusual name. You wouldn't ever. Right. A lot of times you I just don't even think, like, do I need to trademark this? Probably not. It's fine. Like, it's not a first <laughs> thought for a lot of people, especially you're starting up a small business. You've got all the other stuff you have to worry about. All of the, especially when it comes to like people who are creative people and entrepreneurs, the whole legal side of it is usually not in our wheelhouse. So that's not the first no. thing and that any expensive. of us are thinking of. <laughs> and it's expensive. You don't have the same resources. It's a completely different yeah. playing field in that case. Yeah. But it's just not where I ever thought I would end up. Like when we started this, it was literally just me publishing a little pamphlet and then publishing my collection of poetry. And I published my collection as kind of an experiment. And then we published a couple more books and then it kind of gained traction. And if you'd have told me two years ago that I would end up kind of in a bit of a battle with the Daily Wire. <laughs> and like I said before, it's quite uplifting to me to know that there will be people searching for something that they think is morally right and then coming across us who they might think are morally wrong, but then maybe get a bit curious and have a look at what we do and maybe have their minds and their ideas opened up just that little bit. Yeah, because there it can't be overstated the impact of just exposing someone to a new point of view it's exposing mm -hmm. someone to new information that they may have not intersected with before. So if this whole debacle helps people find your stuff who maybe wouldn't have ever heard about it before and they do see a new perspective and are willing to hear something new from somebody that's an overall positive impact so i i'm really hoping that that's the way it goes for you guys me too me too i mean we we are going great guns at the minute like one of our collections has been nominated for a scottish book award um so one of our anthologies our anthology of, of northern english poetry won an award last year so we've got loads going on and we've got a real presence and all we can do is is capitalize on that and just say right we're going to get all of these names out there we're going to tell all of these people's stories and i'm going to treat this as the opportunity it is and try and get as many perspectives as possible out there so that people learn who we are through this rather than just being outraged <laughs> i love that i love i love i also i just love the productive attitude that you guys are taking towards it and seeing like what what good can we make out of the situation i love seeing that i am definitely going to link your guys website in the description of my video <laughs> i encourage everyone to check out bent key publishing your guys your books i mean i only even heard about you guys through this which is cool and like this was a positive impact for me because now I know about you guys existing I you know I live in the U.S. I never would have heard about this probably otherwise and so it's really cool I'm excited to check out your books they look really good a lot of the I covers are really exciting <laughs> they're just really beautiful so I'm very excited to check out some of these books yeah. and read them I encourage everyone who's watching to check that out in the description below as well yeah, we've got well, we have an amazing queer artist who does all of our covers. We work together really closely. Everything we do is is just to amplify and lift. And and Sam is an incredible book cover artist, as you'll see if you go and check out our website. The covers are phenomenal, the and they, they reflect beautiful. what's inside. They reflect what's inside, which is you know just 
gorgeous, authentic, real stories of real experiences and not always traumatic ones, just real life celebrations of the self. And that's what we want to uplift. I'm going to have to get this t-shirt that says young, talentless, millennial poet. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to get that. That's great. That was the guy on Facebook who told me that I um, was running a pointless endeavor because we were all just young, talentless, millennial poets and we were going to go nowhere. So, so we took it and put it on a t-shirt. I love it. I love it. There's a, I, I get why your name is Ben Key and like the whole story. Cause there really is a whole just theme of resilience going on with from the story that got you guys the name that you have to, you know, anytime someone gives you negative feedback, you're going to turn it into something positive <laughs> and see what something good is you can make out of that. When you have this whole thing with the daily wire going on, you're going <laughs> to try to see if you can find ways to get it to be a way where more people find out about it. I love, I love that. I just love your whole approach to this. And I really, I really wish you guys success with everything you're oh, doing because it's, you. I'm really, I'm really happy for you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm really Thank glad you. to have heard uh, your story about this and just to get to know more about what you do so thank you so much so we're turning this into a small business shout out check out bent key publishing which is linked in the description below go show bent key publishing some love so overall, Bent Key, the Daily Wire streaming service, is definitely a mixed bag. While it contains a few really well-made shows, I can't see it being worth the price unless you're just paying to support the Daily Wire as a company. But they've said it themselves, they're not running a charity, they're running a real big boy capitalist organization, so you should only pay for it if you find the value to be truly worth the cost, and I sure don't. While their licensed content from other existing studios is really good in some places, a lot of their original content falls short and some of it falls into the very political territory that they were seeking to avoid. But I think that's actually the big takeaway here. Whether or not something is political or biased isn't a binary, it's complex. What is and is not controversial is relative based on our own perspectives of what is normal and what is the default in our own experiences in the first place. And that's why it's so disingenuous to make a platform that you claim is free of all political influences. In conclusion, if you want to watch Bluey and someone says we have Bluey at home, you should run. Anyway, stay tuned for more on this topic on Jordan's channel, Dead Domain, which will be coming out in a couple days. That channel is linked in the description below. I will see you guys again next week for more videos. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all this in the comments below. In the meantime, though, I hope you have a great weekend and don't forget to support small businesses like Bent Key Publishing, which is linked in the description below. Give them some love. Bye, friends! Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.